Uh, Jean Erdman is uh, one of the leading figures, known as one of the leading figures of the post-pioneer period in American modern dance. Of course, the pioneers being Martha Graham, Doris Humphrey, Charles Weidman, and Hanya Holm. So she's part of the next generation. And she made substantial contributions to the development of American modern dance and also uh, American theater. Jean was born uh, February 20th, 1916, in Honolulu, Hawaii. So imagine being born in Hawaii at that time, right? Uh, her father, John Piney Erdman, was um, a missionary from New England. He had um, worked in Japan and then made his way over to Hawaii, so where he lived. Her mother, Marion Dillingham, was a daughter of the, one of the industrial families of Hawaii, the families that built the railroads across Hawaii. So she came from a very comfortable, happy home. She was one of five children, one boy and four girls. The brother uh, unfortunately died in his 20s in a polo accident, so she really felt like, you know, grew up as sisters. And um, she grew up dancing. Being in Hawaii, uh, all the sisters, everybody danced hula, party hulas, picnic hulas. It was very much part of life, you know? And um, also, Hawaii, uh, especially Honolulu, being known as the crossroads of the Pacific, it wasn't just hula that she was exposed to, but uh, Tahitian dance, Samoan dance, Chinese opera dance, uh, Japanese, kabuki, and no. And her father was very much part of that community. He preached in Japanese and in English. So there was a great respect for all the other cultures on that island. And this uh, love of dance and of other cultures was something that was deep set in her and very much part of her creative uh, juices uh, throughout her entire career. And she often returned to it, you know, her study of, of other dance forms. Um, so she had this very happy childhood, and then she was sent east for high school, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, um, Miss Hall School for Girls. <laughs> and she had a very significant experience there because, of course, being from Hawaii, that was very new to the other girls who were all from mainland US, mostly New England. And she taught them the hula because they wanted to learn it. And she was punished. Yeah. You were not supposed to dance like that. You were certainly not supposed to move your hips like that. I mean, that was really bad form. And that was a very significant uh, kind of um, philosophical issue for her. You know, how could it be so wonderful and lovely and the right thing to do in Hawaii and be so wrong here in New England? And um, she, so that question of what is the value of dance, what is the purpose of dance, what's the meaning of dance, you know, was, was really um, sort of fomented by that experience. And she went on to college at Sarah Lawrence, and she was able to explore that question more. And she did it uh, under the influence of two people who were very important to her. One was Martha Graham, who was teaching dance technique there. Um, and the other was Joseph Campbell, who was teaching comparative mythology uh, and would uh, become her husband. So um, Joe's interest, I their, their interests were very similar. They were 12 years apart. He was 12 years older, obviously. Um, but his interest in story, narrative, that uh, was told through mythologies with different variations, but similar stories all around the world, very much mirrored her interest then in dance, what was important to people all around the world, and how did they tell it and dance it, you know, in, in their traditional dances. So they had very similar uh, 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 interests, and, and this made for a lifelong collaboration. And also, um, along with the particular interest in the stories was um, of what value are these stories? Not from a political point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. 
Who are we as human beings? What does it mean to be human? What are the experiences we go through that are similar in, in every culture? And what are, what's different? You know? uh, or what are the local inflections of, of what's different? So she was happily dancing away with Martha Graham, uh, loved the technique, was completely captivated by this very dynamic torso-oriented movement, and of course Martha being so dramatic herself, um, and also captivated by what she was learning from Campbell. And in 1937, uh, she had a very special opportunity. Well, two things actually happened. Martha invited her to come join her company. And at the same time, her father retired from preaching and decided he wanted to take a trip around the world and invited any of his daughters who wanted to, to come with him. And um, Jean had to make a choice of what to do. And she went up to Martha and said, you know, that she'd been given this opportunity. And Martha said, oh, you should go and come to me when you're done. <laughs> so she did go. And uh, each of the daughters who went, uh, and, and her father and her mother as well, chose, uh, they decided they would choose one thing that they would be sure to do that was of interest to that person. And Jean's thing was, wherever we go, I want to see the dance of that culture. So she went around the world in 1937, uh, Asia, Middle East, Europe. Um, I don't, they didn't go to Africa. Um, but you know, around, around the world. And not only was she seeing the traditional dance in a very pure form, but she was corresponding with Professor Campbell. So she was getting these wonderful letters when she would reach port, you know, talking about the mythology of the place, the temples to go to visit, the meaning of what she was seeing. So this was a very, very rich experience for her. And, um, when she came back and they landed in New York, uh, Campbell was there, met her at the boat. They went out. He proposed. <laughs> and uh, her father and mother, not wanting to leave their young daughter alone in New York with this 12-year-older man, said, well, I'm here right now, Jeannie. We can just make the marriage right here. So she got married right away. <laughs> and uh, they had a one-weekend honeymoon in Woodstock, New York. And she came back and went to rehearse for Martha Graham. <laughs> So it was a um, very exciting time. And it was a very exciting time to be part of the Graham Company. Um, that was when Graham first started to bring men into the company. First Eric Hawkins and then Merce Cunningham. The repertory of that period included American Document, uh, Every Soul is a Circus. And most importantly for Jean was um, Letter to the World, which was Graham's uh, Ode to Emily Dickinson. So used the poetry and her life story. And in that, Jean played uh, the one who speaks. So she spoke the poetry uh, to Graham's The One Who Moved. And so she was paired with Martha in moving around the stage and reciting this poetry. And, and the way Jean tells it uh, to me was that Martha let her make up her own choreography. And that um, makes other people who worked with Martha, that makes sense in that, as many choreographers, she would have an idea and she would express the idea to the dancers and the dancers would come up with things in movement and then she would shape it. But for Jean it was really seminal because she was working with um, how her movement related to her speaking. And that was something um, that is a thread throughout her work as it develops. And. Uh, in fact, even when she left Graham's company, she came back as a guest artist well into the 70s to perform that role. Um, another very important thing, being a part of Martha's company, uh, all the female members of the company had to take uh, Louis Horst's dance composition classes. Louis Horst, of course, being Graham's musical director. And he taught these famous courses um, teaching dance composition through pre-classic dance forms, where the dancers had to learn the uh, musical structure of Sarabande and Galliard and Gigue and so forth, uh, all the dances that came before ballet, and had to interpret them in contemporary movement. But they learned musical structure and form. And this was extremely important to how she approached choreography 
um, throughout the rest of her life and uh, set her on her way to making her own work. She performed pieces at the Bennington Summer School of the Dance. Uh, her first choreography was a piece called The Transformations of Medusa. And it's a three-part dance in two-dimensional, archaic style. Uh, and Louis Horst um, did the music, made the music for it, which he didn't often do for his students. But he was very impressed with the dance. At least that's the story I heard. <laughs> and I assume it's true, or why would he have made the music? Jean met Merce. Uh, when he was invited to join Martha's company. She joined in 38, so he was shortly after that. I'm not sure exactly of his year. But interestingly, Joe Campbell knew Mrs. John Cage. There was a Mrs. John Cage, Zenya Kashavarov. She was Russian from Sitka, Alaska, and made her way down the West Coast in the 30s when Joe was doing his bohemian thing, bumming around the West Coast with Carol and John Steinbeck, etc., and met uh, Zenia Kashavarov there. And then when she became Mrs. John Cage and they came to New York, Campbell already knew the Cages, you see. And of course, Cage already knew Cunningham from teaching at Cornish. So there were all these paths that crossed. And they were socially uh, friends. Uh, um, intellectually, socially friends. And uh, the way the story goes, of course, I wish I was a fly on the wall, but I wasn't, um, was that they were all at a New Year's Eve party together, and John said to uh, Joe, you know, I think Jean and Merce ought to do a concert together. And of course, Joe wanted to get Jean away from Martha, and Merce wa uh, uh, John wanted to get Merce away from Martha. So. They must have said yes, because shortly after that, John arranged for the Chicago Arts Club to present these two young stars of the Grand Company. So they did their first duet concert together. There were three duets, and each of them did three solos. And uh, the three duets, one was called Seeds of Brightness. It, ha it was a lyrical opener. I don't even know if we think like that anymore. but. Uh, the music was by Norman Lloyd, and then there was another dance called Ad Lib, which they dared to improvise on stage, which was never done at that time. And then the third piece was called Credo in Us, and it had the subtitle of A Suburban Idol. And it had a little story to it that Merce came in with. Um, and uh, it it's more famous, uh, the, the choreography is lost, but it's quite well known for John's uh, uh, music, Cage's music for that. It was really landmark for him. He used uh, records, which were played for various durations of time. He used doorbells and uh, all kinds of sounds, and it was a real breakthrough in structure for him. Uh, and I think that, that piece is uh, performed quite often today. And, and very interestingly, you, you know, you can use different records than the records he used, so you get a completely different soundscape. Um, the three solos that Jean did on that concert were the Transformations of Medusa, uh, another piece called Forever and Sun Smell, which is uh, used the poem by E. E. Cummings of the same title, and that also had music by Cage, uh, percussion music, and um, chanted. The poem was chanted, but also Jean spoke the poem at various points. And the third piece was Creature on a Journey. That was her third solo. So Creature on a Journey is a delightful dance. It's a humorous dance, and I love dancing comedy. And Jean did too. She made many comic dances. Um, she had great comedic timing. It was one of the three solos that she made for that uh, concert with Merce at the Chicago Arts Club. And Jean said uh, that the way she generally worked was she would warm up for 45 minutes on the floor, 45 minutes standing, and then she'd do a half hour of free improvisation, and then her last hour in the studio would be either working on what came out of the improvisation or going back to something else or whatever. And Creature was a dance that just arrived, completely formed in one of these improvisations, which Anybody who improvises knows that's extremely unusual. Um, and she said herself, I, I, not only did it arrive, but I remembered it, <laughs> you know? 
and, um, and she also immediately recognized it as influenced by uh, Balinese dance, which she had seen in that trip around the world in 1937. And she recognized it uh, with the way the arm carriage, which is very specific, you know, was related to the Balinese dancers. The quick skittering across the floor, uh, she'd seen that. And uh, as she says, just the delight that the Balinese people have in, in moving. Um, so I think that's why the setting comes in that very hot, you know, hot uh, uh, Indonesian afternoon, which I told your lighting designer. Um, and, th and a very interesting thing also after that, so she had the dance, uh, um, and she said to John Cage, she asked John to make music for it because he was making music for the whole concert, and he said, well, I'm just too busy to do that, Jean. But um, I think I have a piece that will go perfectly with it. I think I know a piece. And he was working with Lou Harrison at that time. They were collaborating on their percussion music. And um, so he, and I, it's, I've been thinking, he introduced this piece to her and I thought, I wonder how he did that. 1943, one thing he didn't do was go home to his computer, send her an MP3, have her put it on her, com you know, her iPad and put it in her dock. That didn't happen. <laughs> but um, did, he bring, did he bring in three musicians to play it live? Did he give her uh, sheet music? She could read music. Um, I don't think so. I think I, either it must have brought in live musicians or a wire recording. I saw the original wire recording of this, which we then had to transfer to analog and then uh, digital. Um, but anyhow, she did the dance to the music, and as she said, it fit perfectly which again is kind of miraculous because that's a dance, uh, that music has three percussionists. I think they're in two different time signatures and they change time signatures throughout. And she has her own dynamic pulse that doesn't match any of their signatures and yet relates to it perfectly, sometimes right with it, sometimes as a, 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 a counterpoint, which is very much the way she liked to work musically in all her dances, that counterpoint gives a, a, a rich uh, a texture and layer to her dances that I don't see in other, in her contemporaries, many of her contemporaries. Um, and she continued to perform it after that concert regularly, you know, throughout her career until she couldn't do those little jumps on the floor anymore. Yeah, it was after that concert that Jean told Martha that she was going to go out on her own. And she began her career as an independent choreographer. Um, she was building more repertory. She immediately began teaching um, in different places, uh, outside of New York, and also as part of the new dance group. Uh, she was a member of that. Um, and actually, very interestingly, she and Hadassah and Pearl Primus were the directors of the ethnic division of the new dance group. Um, and Jean taught hula there. She taught flamenco. And she taught fundamentals of modern dance as well. So it was really a place for her to develop her work as a teacher. And also, because there were, oh, I think 12 or so members of the new dance group, it was quite a large group, they could all pool their resources and rent a Broadway theater or, or a, a, a good theater in New York and present their work once a year. So it's interesting, Jean's relationship to the new dance group, um, because as you just said, they were interested in reaching the common person, everybody. Um, they were also very interested in socially motivated dances. And so in this place, Jean diverged from them because her dance, uh, sh she really was not interested at all in, in, in political activity through dance. She had political causes that she was interested in that I know she supported you know, economically uh, throughout her life, but her dance was uh, uh, to touch the spirit. You know, it was about really that human connection to the spirit and that human evolving. And if that moved you to do something, fine, but she, she really didn't believe in dance as a political force. Many of her dances were developed uh, from um, a pure abstract mus movement exploration. For instance, the transformation of Medusa began by just 
uh, um, trying to uh, uh, explore the two-dimensional form, and she was asking herself the question, why would anybody move like this? What does it mean? What does it feel like? Um, and her answer was that it was a fanatic, you know, someone who was very caught in, in one, only seeing one thing, you know, because that, that it, it was so rigid. You know, and um, so she approached it purely from this uh, exploration of two dimensions. And then she would show once a week, she had a little showing in her studio for Joe, and he would come and comment on the work. And when she finished, it's a dance in three sections. When she finished the first section, he said, why don't you call it Gorgonian? Uh, because it's about Medusa. And she said, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, she didn't set out to make a dance about that. But then, once he explained why he felt that, she went up to the Metropolitan Museum, she was looking at all the Greek vases, she was exploring, and of course he was giving her all the information about the variations of that myth, what it meant, what it, you know, meant to other cultures and so forth, and she evolved the dance. Um, and that was a pattern uh, for many of the dances that she made, especially Mm, I would say all through the 50s, yeah, uh, 40s and 50s. Yeah. And the dances are, are quite different uh, and quite beautiful. Um, for example, Ophelia, uh, which didn't start out with the name Ophelia uh, at all, was a dance where she wanted to explore what it looked like and felt like in dance when someone came to an emotional threshold and couldn't cross it. You know, what happened? Uh, what, uh, instead of a successful passage, they dismembered. Another dance of that period is called uh, Daughters of the Lonesome Isle. Beautiful trio, uh, in which she was exploring what does it mean to me to be female without being in relationship to a, a man? just what is the essence of femaleness. And she was looking for that in pure form. It's a very abstract, very lyrical dance. Uh, has a beautiful score on p prepared piano by John Cage. Um, so these were the kinds of things that, that she was exploring and that make up her repertory. And then in the early 60s, I think 62 or 63, um, she got a grant uh, for a year to explore the possibility of turning James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake into a dance piece. Um, that seemed to be an impossible task. <laughs> uh, her husband had uh, co-written with Henry Morton Robinson a book called The Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake. That was a seven-year project for him. And uh, as collaborators, he read every word he wrote to her. No matter what they were doing, they had breakfast together, and he read every sentence he wrote, and she commented on his work. So she was completely immersed in Finnegan's Wake for seven years. And um, she was very fascinated by the central female character, uh, whose name is Anna Livia Plorabelle, and uh, uh, Joyce knows her as the River Liffey that goes through Dublin, uh, and as every female character you meet in the book, including the hen Belinda of the Dorans. Um, and so her uh, uh, interpretation of this focused on all the permutations of Anna Olivia Plorabelle. So this was a piece with four actors, one dancer, and a beautiful musical score by Teiji Ito for three musicians that used instruments from all over the world. She presented it at the Village South Theater uh, in Greenwich Village, and it was an immediate hit, and won the Obie Award and Drama Desk Award, and from that, uh, that piece toured the world several times. Um, they were at the uh, Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, in Paris, in Dublin, they were in Tokyo, and that sort of kept her working for five years. <laughs> and later in her career, she did it again. And that is probably her best known work. In 72, she, uh, Jo retired from Sarah Lawrence, and she had money from having done Broadway. <laughs> and they decided to establish a theater called Theater of the Open Eye, which would be a, a, a home base for her to explore this, what the French press called total theater. And the first piece that she did that 
uh, with was <laughs> never to pick something easy, <laughs> was called Moon Mysteries, and it was three uh, Irish no plays by William Butler Yeats. So they used Irish mythology, Irish heroes, but in the form of Japanese no plays. And um, I mean, that's sort of mind boggling right there, isn't it? <laughs> and then you take that on top of that and you see how Jean did it with her interest in Southeast Asian theater that you shadow puppetry and masks. And I mean, you got something that was really quite amazing. I was an undergraduate at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio. And um, Gladys Balin from the original Nikolai Company uh, came out to teach there the same year that I was a freshman. Gladys, a uh, born and raised New Yorker, uh, left only to raise her son in a quieter <laughs> place, a healthier atmosphere. And um, she was on the original faculty that Jean put together for the NYU School of the Arts. Um, so when she met me, she saw something in me, which I don't know really what exactly that was, but she said to me, you ought to meet Jean Erdman. And I didn't even know who Martha Graham was at that point, because I had been a ballet baby. So, uh, but I was interested <laughs> in everything, and especially anybody, oh, so I should meet her? Okay. So Gladys wrote me a letter of introduction, and I was originally from the East Coast, so on my holidays I would go back to the East Coast. And I went to New York, and with my little letter of introduction, and I met Jean. Uh, who was very warm, very friendly, very open. And um, Shirley Wimmer, who was the head of the department at OU, said, why don't you see if you can do an internship with Jean? So I asked, and she said, well, sure, why not? So I spent the first semester of my senior year as an intern with the Theater of the Open Eye. My job was ward wardrobe mistress and general understudy of every female role. And somebody got sick. And in three days, I did five roles. So um, that was very exciting. <laughs> and when it was all over, Jean said to me, so what are you going to do when you graduate? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I'm going to come back to New York. She said, well, why don't you come stop in and see us? <laughs> so um, when I graduated, I came back and joined the Theater of the Open Eye. Starting about 1980, maybe 79, 80, um, Jean started bringing back more and more of these old dances. And we would do a festival each uh, Christmas time, Christmas New Year's week, where we would learn some more of these dances. And she would also present our choreography. She was very generous that way. The open eye was a really collaborative artistic home for people. And that led to a major retrospective of her work in 1985 um, at Hunter Playhouse. And we did, I think we did about 15 or so dances. And I was her assistant director on that. And, um, you know, all that time getting to learn the dances and do it, I, I just fell in love more and more, one after the next. I, you couldn't give me enough. <laughs> um, what did I first learn it? Early 80s. Early 80s. She, she, um, there were about six dancers, four, four, four or six of us, female dancers. And she sat us all down one day and she started to describe all these dances we'd never seen that she was interested in reviving. And uh, she described Creature on a Journey. I said, oh, I want to do that. That's what I am. I'm a creature on a journey. And she said, Nancy, we all are. <laughs> um, so, but she let me do it. I took to it, and I knew she really liked the way I did it when she finally made a costume that was my size. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yes, yeah, so along about the same time, 85, Joe was working with uh, Bill Moyers on the series The Power of Myth, and that was a culminating you know, work of, of his career. And so she had a similar idea. I, she said, I'd really like to make a video of my dances. And I said, well, I'll help you do that. And that became a six-year project um, to make the three-volume video archive, Dance and Myth, the World of Jean Erdman. 
and I was the executive producer of that, and I danced in eight of the 11 dances. So that was a, that was fantastic. I, you know, a labor of love. I worked till my eyeballs were full and uh, delighted to do it. Nancy provided really a foundation of some of Erdman's personal movement exploration. Before we started learning the choreography, each day we actually engaged in a warm-up that was based on movements that she had gathered, and um, I think she was really influenced by global and world dance and was maybe one of the first female choreographers to be able to explore that. And at a time where everybody was codifying their own technique, I think this was her gateway in, and that felt really important for Nancy to share that with us. So the three of us started together in the room and just went through very specific articulations of, I would say mostly, almost like an isolation phrase, head, shoulders, rib cage, pelvis. Um, to start to really find these nuances in the body that were going to be really particular and important to the piece. I found that very helpful. This time as you inhale, slightly shift back towards your heels and begin to curve your spine very long from your head to your heels. And as you exhale, start to shift forward into the balls of your feet, make a long arch from your head to your heels. Nancy focused a lot in these classes on breath. Um, and how the breath kind of inspired each movement and where it initiated and how it initiated the movement. And that felt really grounding for me. So that when we approached this material, which seemed very light and kind of bubbly, there was kind of a, a weight behind it. And I think the, the focus on the breath and how one moves with the breath in this sort of technique was um, really instrumental. When I watched Nancy um, dance, it was, um, super helpful. I think I'm a visual person more than anything. And uh, she had this lightness about the way that she um, went about exploring this creature and the, the way that she moved her head. Um, it just something clicked in that she was, uh, she talked a lot about not really using your eyes to see, but it's almost like you're hearing, which got that image of the bird for me really instantly. Um, but she was also, Nancy seemed really interested in me having my own experience, my own exploration, and that she was just kind of providing me with the foundation and then wanted it to come from my own place in the end, in the final performance. So we talked a lot about acting and um, things that she was thinking about or things that I could possibly think about along the way, but it seemed like she was interested in my personal experience. I think what this piece became for me and this creature who I adore. Um, it was hard to kind of make that final commitment into the silliness of this, even though I feel like it is very close to my own personality. For some reason, kind of bridging. <laughs> it felt like it should have been very easy, but it, it was challenging. And I think that I did a lot of work, both with Hannah and with Nancy, about finding my own way in and being able to take it really seriously without um, going over the top or not doing quite enough. But in the end, it was um, kind of the most fun because I felt like I was this, um, well, as this creature, I thought of myself as this amazing, beautiful <laughs> um, entity. And I was going on this journey, you know, from point A to point B, but along the way, it was like I was retelling the story of my life in the most dramatic and important way possible, which was super fun. Um, and um, there's a moment where I do this, like, big releve, and I just felt like I was accepting my Academy Award a little bit. <laughs> and so I loved it. <laughs> um, 
but also in this like dramatic retelling of my life, I would get confused and things would happen and I would hear noises and I would need to check those out. And so, um, you know, like my story would get off track <laughs> and I'd go explore and then remember like that I had this beautiful tail that people should see. Um, you know, my feathers and this, uh, the costume. So it was, um, it was kind of crazy, but in the most fun way. <laughs> this costume, which I adored, was m the most specific costume I have ever worn. Um, most of my experience has been kind of abstract um, costume ideas that were more about movement or color. And this was so specific. I mean, I felt like a different person when I put it on. And I think Val did an incredible job. And I think, um, I don't, I don't want to um, make the color or the, the movement of this costume to seem any less because it was really important. Super vibrant colors <laughs> and lots of patterns and waves and lines. But putting the booties on, the leotard and the kind of the weight of the skirt and the comb in my hair and the side ponytail, I kind of would catch myself <laughs> in the mirror <laughs> and be um, like it needed to be documented <laughs> because it felt so specific and I felt like a completely different being, which was really fun and really funny to be backstage. <laughs> kind of hanging out and getting ready with my friends, but feeling like I was um, slightly off my rocker. <laughs> and the dancing of it, the weight of the skirt was really informative, because it kind of had a life of its own. <laughs> I would turn and it would follow me a, a few seconds later, which made me really feel like I had this um, big, beautiful, like, peacock tail. Um, and it... <laughs> I wanted people to see it. The live music uh, kept things fresh for me. So when I was talking about um, retelling this dramatic, kind of embellished story of my life, it was the music that would um, kind of take me into a new direction and uh, keep me in the moment so I didn't get too caught up because I think the beauty of this bird is that she cannot focus. So it really helped change my focus. I actually remember the first rehearsal with live music. And I think Stephanie and I both had a wow moment of, oh, OK, that's what that sound is that we kind of faintly heard on the recording. And it just, it became amplified 100%, I think, the connection between the choreography and these sounds and articulations that were affecting the choreography. It became totally synthesized as opposed to, we're, we're putting this dance on top of these things that we sort of hear. Um, I really, I remember that pretty strongly as a big, powerful, yay, live music moment. Mm -hmm. And to see them also, to see them performing when we did it in the, the studio at first. And it was fantastic because it was kind of chaotic and they're on these different bonk, bonk, and the thwacks and quacks and whatever was coming out of those instruments was um, as delightful as the choreography itself. That was my first experience um, teaching rep to a group of integrated dancers. and. I think the choice of Creature on a Journey was perfect. A little nod to our artistic director for that choice. <laughs> um, I realized in that workshop how crucial the narrative was. And it was not a pre-planned thought or idea that I'm going to teach this dance to this group of individuals based on narrative. It just happened. Um, and it was one thing I rem remember struggling with initially as a a performer or learning the movement was the intricacy of the movement, but immediately layered into that was our narrative, our sense of inner monologue, and feeling like I couldn't quite accomplish both at the same time that I needed them to be a little bit more parceled out while I was learning. 
And it was through teaching it that I realized you can't. They had to go together. Um, I don't think I stopped talking <laughs> the entire time. And it was definitely Nancy's voice in my head. Look, oh, what is this? Oh, what, I found that? And I just was trying to feed them their own inner monologue through my example. And I would demonstrate the movements, but it was a very limited time that we had to actually transfer the material. And so I was less concerned with specificity of movement. They were certainly going to have their own versions and variations, which was fantastic. Um, but I think the idea of having them each create a storyline um, was the only way that it was going to be transferred and work. And they were incredible. I think just in general, teaching repertory is valuable because we can read about what's happened and we can see videos, but as dancers, I think it is really important to actually get to do some of the material. So you are really understanding the history of this art form that you dedicate your life to. Um, and I think it is one of the most valuable experiences because you are like embodying your history. I first started to be interested in Lou Harrison when I was in college studying composition and um, he was one of the more free thinking, free spirited West Coast style composers and I was attracted to that school of thought. And um, he also lived in Santa Cruz which is really close to my home. Um, so his, he was a little more prominent in those circles than I think in elsewhere in the country. And then I first met him when I was at the University of Arizona for a seminar and I had some master classes with him. Really took a liking to him right away. He talked about a lot of um, forms from the medieval period in the early Renaissance which I had never heard of before and he was composing in these forms. Composing pieces uh, for Yo-Yo Ma and also for just intonated piano and harpsichord in these forms like the stampy, which is similar to a rondo. And uh, yeah, stuff like that, which I didn't really receive permission to write that kind of music from my teachers in school. And here was someone who was legendary and just really brilliant and sensitive and kind of giving me permission as an artist to go outside of the box of 12-tone of 20th century new music and, and use some other uh, sort of, yeah, esoteric composition tools. So I, I liked him right away and it was um, exciting for me when this project came up to play for Creature because I knew a lot about his method of working and how he put things together and I was curious to see what these percussion pieces were like and it was a lot of fun to play it. The recording I believe was Merce Cunningham and John Cage and Doris Halpern playing the percussion parts and really lo-fi recording as they usually are from those early modern dance um, recordings and videos and we noticed that they were making a lot of mistakes. And there are a lot of places in the music where you really have to count and you have to all hit the wood blocks and the gongs and the turtle shells together at exactly the same time according to the score but their success rate on hitting those hits at the same time was pretty low um, and it it still worked perfectly for the piece I think it was, it was exciting when we when we played it I think it was a lot different because we were together a lot of the time. I 
it's uh, definitely a counting piece, and the time signatures change almost every measure. And the, they're in eighth notes, so you know it's, it'll be like. One two three four five. One two three four. One two three. One two three four five six. One two three four five. So it's that stuff going on, and then on the third page, we all go into each of us is in a different time signature, all the time. So there there are three of us, and one one is counting in five for a, you know a measure. Another player is in three, and another player is in four. So things kind of come unhinged there. And you're on, you're on your own. You can't depend on anyone else. So it is really challenging and and fun. And yeah, definitely was difficult to memorize because it's kind of just like memorizing Morse code or something. And uh, you got to just stay stay in it and not lose your focus. Um, the instrumentation was is really cool in those a lot of those pieces from that period, especially the percussion pieces where they're using found instruments and you know tortoise shells and brake drums and and small gongs i mean when you say small gong that's really up for interpretation and and we had a, a good challenge trying to find sounds in you know available to us that match the sounds on the tape and we tried to get as close as we could um, but yeah that's that's so fun and i remember the the Bauhaus pieces, they sent a picture of the instruments that were used in the recording. I really appreciated that. I, I wish they always would have taken photos of their setup because it's worth a thousand words. I think it was really important to perform that music live with Creature. Um, I think, well, you know, I, I always love live music and believe that it's much more spiritually resonant in the in the moment than recorded music is. Um, in this case, I think that it's, it's so exciting. It's like what, when you're watching stock car racing and you're just hoping that uh, that accident doesn't happen, you know, but it, it's exciting to know that there's, there's something going on in the room that's happening right now, and it's not just the performance of the choreography, but it's the performance of a difficult score as well, and things could go wrong and fall apart, and I think that's what gives the sense of magic, just the, the people on stage experiencing that, and not being nervous, per se, but knowing that they're really creating it now and it's there's no safety net